morning. How are you guys doing? Everybody got their coffee in hand, ready to go. Yes, okay. Today we're going to be looking at the general idea of the science and the art of teaching. But I'd like you to turn this around and think more about the art in the science of teaching. A lot of you already are very wonderful artists in this craft of ours in the science of education. But what we want to try to do today is link that into the science. Where is the neuroscience perhaps behind some of this information? Before I start, I want to extend an invitation. I'd like you to write down my e email address and this website in case you want the slides. You can take all the pictures you want, but if you want slides, go ahead and just write me. And also for follow-up. Hopefully this is a partnership. This is an alliance. We're all trying to do the same thing, reach this high quality education. And sometimes along the way we have questions about different parts of our jobs or the way that we can apply certain types of methodologies. Or what I'd like to do is extend the invitation that if you are willing to take the time to write and explain things to me, I always write back. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I won't lie to you. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, here's some information. Um, can I point you in the right direction? So hopefully you'll take me up on that, that invitation. But I also want to use this as a teaching moment. Does anybody know why I'm asking you to write something right now? Why do human beings write? I'm going to give you a really big hint, a nice idea to start the morning off. There is no learning if you don't have well-functioning memory systems and well-functioning attention systems. Those are two vital pillars to all of learning. So now if I ask you, why are you writing? Why did I ask you to write something? Hopefully it gets you to pay attention, but mostly it's going to extend your memory. Our memories are very fragile, and so if you write nothing down, you probably don't pass it into long-term memory, therefore you're probably really not going to learn very much from the experiences you have. So please do write this down. I hope that that's something that's uh, now intuitive to you. And I'm also going to ask you to keep those pencils out or those tablets out because at the very end, I'm going to ask you to do a bit of a reflection in order to sort of see, did this make a difference? I want to challenge you to see or think about, is there anything I'm going to say to you that would be new? Something you haven't heard before? Perhaps three things that you didn't know before. And then also, two things that you're curious about now, that you want to know even further, you want to know a lot more about this. And that's what I hope you'll write me the email on, right? But perhaps the most important thing is are you willing to do something differently based on the information that we talk about today? Would you actually change your practice as a teacher to do something slightly different based on the information we share, okay? So it's sort of a heads up. I'm gonna be asking you this at the very end, so hopefully you'll be able to write these things down. In the course that I teach at um, Harvard University Extension School, it's called the Neuroscience of Learning. It's an introduction to mind, brain, health, and education. We do three, two, ones after every single encounter. And it's a really powerful thing because at the very end of the semester, we pull all of these things together and share them. And people realize, wow, I did learn a lot. And yes, I am so curious now about these aspects about the brain and learning. And these are things, these are promises to myself about how I'm gonna better my practice. And so I just want you to know that this is one of those very powerful tools. I hope you guys can also incorporate that into your own courses as well. So I'm gonna start by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to come back to Oahu. Some of you might have known. Uh, my dad grew up in Aiea and so um, basically, we came back here every single summer, ever since I was really little. And so I thought I would be nostalgic and take the opportunity to show you a couple of pictures. It's also the chance for me to um, also sort of publicly call out uh, my cousin uh, and publicly embarrass here, and, and also my auntie, public school teachers here on Oahu who are really exceptional. But the other thing I want to do with this picture is tell you a little bit about um, my dad who is probably one of the best teachers I have ever known. And I get the chance to actually observe literally thousands of teachers around the world. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about him because it's gonna help us illustrate what we really mean about the art in the science of teaching. Before we start into my dad, we're gonna, the first thing we're gonna talk about is values that have sort of transcended going into the science, understanding neuroscience, what's going on in the brain, really, and how it learns. But what does this do about the things we already value 
in great teachers, okay? The second thing I'd like to do is to share six principles, just six small things that a large group of neuroscientists have agreed this is good information for teachers. Because unfortunately, in general settings and through popular press books and sometimes in professional development, teachers receive a lot of information about the brain that doesn't have evidence behind it. And there's actually a group of people, 41 different experts from 11 different countries, in reflecting upon this, they actually could only agree on six things that we should tell teachers. And that's what I want to share with you today. And then additionally, I want to leave you with four ideas, hopefully big ideas, that might be a little bit more transformative and to think about how you might incorporate that into your own life, okay? So, we talk about my dad. My dad was a teacher for years, but he began not as a teacher. He actually left. I, uh, he was given a, a scholarship to study nuclear physics. ROTC scholarship, right, in UC Berkeley. What he didn't realize is that when you get to Berkeley, nuclear physics in the 60s was not like the thing to do. <laughs> so there was a bit of protests and things like that, and about in the second year of college, you know, love child, we were born, my sisters and I, and he shifted gears drastically. Um, he had a real change of consciousness. He started to think, what does it really mean to serve your country, to be part of the greater fabric of society, to contribute, to give. So a lot of his friends were off to Peace Corps and stuff like that, but he said, no, I'm gonna do something bigger and bolder. I'm gonna be a public school teacher. And not only that, he decided that he was not only gonna be a public school teacher, he was gonna teach math in public schools. And not only was he gonna teach math in public schools, he was gonna go to some kind of crummy neighborhoods where kids had a lot of trouble, broken homes, drugs, gangs, things like that. So he's gonna be a public school teacher teaching math in a bad neighborhood. But to top it all off, to make sure he set himself the biggest challenge possible, he decided to do this in middle school. <laughs> so he took on this very big challenge and I watched him develop. I mean, it was a, a beautiful thing. He actually developed beautifully as a teacher, and I can say that because literally we were born when he was 19, right? So I watched him grow into his career and to see how he really developed in that. And some of the highlights that I'd like to point out, because when he finished being a teacher, I kept thinking, what made him so great? What was it that got kids to stop on the street when they were adults to say, hey, Mr. Toke, Mr. Toke, Good to see you again. Yeah, that's what they called them. I know, 60s, well, anyways. So they would, call, they would come up to him, they would send him wedding invitations, and they would say things like, you changed my life. And I thought, that is the greatest profession on earth. You get to actually change people's lives. So if I were to sort of list out some of the things that he did that were really important, I'd have to say, I'll give you a handful of them, right? And you guys tell me if you agree, this still makes a great teacher. He really believed that his students could learn. He believed in them. He also um, had a personal connection with them. He never stopped you know, knowing everybody's name and talking to them very directly. He also let everyone in that whole classroom feel like they mattered. This group matters. It's not just the individual, it's the collection, right? He also understood their backgrounds and their histories. He knew that they didn't come from some easy households, and he took the time to understand where they were coming from. Some of them were immigrant families. Um, at that time, it was mainly Vietnamese immigrants that were, were, were coming into the country. Um, but they were coming into Chicano, into Mexican-American uh, neighborhoods, and so there were all these clashes with the gangs and stuff like that. He also knew that different people were bringing different gifts into that classroom. In addition to that, he also knew, he came to know, he didn't know this immediately, but he realized that they could not learn if they were highly emotionally stretched, if they felt anxious or depressed about anything. He knew that these strings or these really extremes of emotional feelings wouldn't allow them to learn. 
But he also knew some other things, that the kids who had to work two or three jobs after school to help their families, when they hadn't slept or eaten very well, they also couldn't learn, right? But he has his finger on the pulse there. He also knew that different kids needed different interventions at different times or stages of their growth. Which means he didn't just say, oh, we're all going to do problem-based learning, or we're all going to do um, this kind of motivational activity. He realized different kids reacted to different things at different stages of their own development. But probably the biggest thing is that he knew that he had this power in the classroom. He could get these kids come in and all spaced out and all over the place, but he had this way of capturing them and getting them to focus, right? So if I look at all of these characteristics, I thought, this is really fascinating. Because when I began to look into more about what is going on in the brain, it all sort of fit really cleanly. So one of the things I want to share with you is if we talk about the art in the science of learning, if we go now, I'm just talking about the title is The Science and the Art, but I want to look at from the artistic part going to the science. Is there a connection here? So when I say, you know, he really believed in his students. Well, today you might hear bantered about this idea of a growth mindset. He believed that they would be able, that learning was fluid, that they were going to be able to learn. And when we talk about this now in terms of the brain, we talk about neuroplasticity. Your brain can and does learn throughout the lifespan. So he basically intuitively knew something that we now are calling one thing, but we can actually prove and have evidence at another plane about uh, looking at the brain. When I say that uh, he also he had this personal connection with the students. Many of you have heard in some of the presentations about um, Hattie's work and the effect size. Well, one of these stronger effect size is basically student-teacher relationships, right? But this is actually manifested as understanding that learning is completely social as well as cognitive. You just don't have those things isolated from one another. When I say that this uh, fellow transmitted to everybody in the room, you matter. You are an important part of this learning community. He was being very inclusive for the kids that had all kinds of different difficulties. He was being very inclusive in what he did. He was also, I told you he's a math teacher, this is the best formula he ever taught. <laughs> One plus one is three. You have a good idea, and I have a good idea. But the minute we exchange those ideas, we're going to have something even more powerful than any one of us could have come up with by ourselves. And he let the group know that. And he also took advantage of what we now call theory of mind. The way people begin to know who they are is by knowing the other. The more I know you, the better I understand myself. So these things are maybe common terms you've heard of now, but this is actually manifested in this general concept of understanding that all brains are unique, but in addition to that, a great appreciation for human variance. Different people are going to be bringing different things to the table, and that's really important, because each of those different kinds of pieces is going to help us create that, that bigger vision of what it is in our learning dynamics of the classroom. When you talk about the idea that he valued the histories and the background of those kids, he didn't lament that they're not all the same. Oh, you know, this kid is coming from this background, this other background. Some other kids, uh, this kid has lost two years of school already. This other one still doesn't speak enough English to be in his class, but he's got to now learn higher math or whatever it is. He understood their backgrounds. And this is when we talk about understanding the kids well enough to be able to teach an authentic learning context. He was able to create math problems that fit their reality. That's authentic learning. But this also means, from a neuroscientific perspective, that we understand and appreciate that all new learning passes through a filter of prior experience. There is nothing that you will learn that's new that your brain doesn't first say, well, it's a lot of energy to learn. Let me first figure out, do I already know something about this? And all of you who are great teachers, you all really realize that if a person doesn't, is learning something totally new, the best way, if they can't really grasp or relate it to something that's prior experience, you use an analogy. 
analogy, something that's an analogous situation, something that parallels the new concept, that's the number one best way of helping a brain learn that doesn't have any idea about what you're talking about, especially related to math. So he understood that. He also understood that different kids needed different things. This is now called differentiation in our schools, right? But this also goes to this idea of grit, of helping kids understand and realize it's not just your starting point, man, stick with it, perseverance, you're gonna be able to get to it. It's just that right now, it's easy for this guy because he's had a lot of prior experience with this, but you're gonna be able to do this. Hang in there, right? So this is understanding that different um, types, different people have different types of potentials because of what you're born with. But um, how many of you have heard of this concept of nature versus nurture? Nature versus nurture? We don't say that anymore. <laughs> we now say that you are who you are because of the genes you inherited. That's nature, right? You have this genetic potential, right? But only a fraction of that is actually potentiated by your environment, okay? So you are nature via nurture. But here's a very big finding that's coming out of resiliency studies. There are some kids who are born with like not too great genetic makeup, and also in a really bad zip code, and they still make it. So in resiliency studies, the big idea was to try to figure out what is playing there. It's not nature, it's not nurture, what's going on? So now we say nature via nurture plus free will. You get to choose what's going to happen. You get to maximize your own potential. And this is one of these very big, powerful things that maybe back in the 60s um, wasn't naturally intuitive, but I think it's something that my dad really had his finger on. In addition to that, he knew that um, students could not learn if they had these really extreme emotional states, if they were sad, if they were angry, if they were depressed, if they were anxious, or if they felt bullied and intimidated. If we understand that, we also understand that there's a very big connection between the mind-body connection, right? You guys know the difference between emotions and feelings? And an emotion is something you can't really control. It's of the body. It's a hormone, a neurotransmitter, a chemical that will release, that will make your body have that tight knot in your stomach or your fist feels like punching somebody out or whatever. Whereas the feeling is of the mind. You get to choose how you react to the emotional state, right? So understanding this balance between mind and body was important, but he also had his finger on the button there of uh, understanding social-emotional learning. And this gets to a very big point that we now understand in neuroscience is that cognition and emotion are inextricably linked. There is no learning without emotion. So if we know all of these things now, now that we can actually measure that and show that. But the very powerful thing is if you can help teachers understand what is that exact kind of trigger uh, that makes that kid feel that way or, or have that emotion, how can you now help him feel in a different way? And he also knew that um, he could not, uh, the kids could not concentrate if they were distracted with something or, and or if they had not slept or eaten well. So also of the mind and of the body. And this, is a, this leads to a very interesting idea, which I hope is filtered to your schools. We think we have an epidemic of ADHD in our society. Um, what I think is we have a real big problem with sleep hygiene. When you look at a kid and you diagnose and you say, what are the symptoms of ADHD? And then you look at the symptoms of not sleeping enough, identical. So we quickly diagnose and say, this kid has an attention problem. Well, he can't, panic, can't pay attention because he hasn't slept well, right? So this gets us to sort of rethink the way we diagnose things. And the big idea is to begin with the physical. Has the kid eaten well? Has he slept well? Number one. Then from there, if you could say, yeah, he has. Okay, now let's go to the psychological. Are his parents fighting incessantly at home and he's totally distracted because they're about to get divorced? Is it psychological? Then, if none of that's in play, then think about the neurophysiological. Could it be he has a chemical imbalance that's actually causing him to have some kind of an attention problem? But you don't start 
with drugging that kid. You start off scaling it up. This is a different way to think about how we diagnose things. And this is because my dad really understood something that, we, uh, that I tried to uh, express to you about writing, that there is no learning without attention and memory. And attention and memory systems are extremely fragile, and they're impacted by a lot of things in the environment. How well we sleep, how well we eat, um, our emotional states, all of that influences whether or not we're able to learn or not, okay? He also knew that um, they had to be totally focused to learn. Learning math problems, especially out of context, how does the quadratic formula fit into my life in the barrio was really hard for a lot of kids, right? So he understood very clearly about concepts of mindfulness, of being centered and focused and being able to use attention systems to their best. But this also is now, now being measured through something called the default mode network or the default mode mechanism. We can actually see in the brain what happens when it's slightly quieted and it's focused. So we can now measure some of the things that were intuitively part of the way people teach. And he also knew that different tools were helping different kids at different moments was what we talk about um, as far as uh, differentiation is concerned. But he also understood the cycle. Learning is not A to B, and it happens really quickly, okay? It's almost like taking a step up a spiraling staircase where you do two steps forward and one step back, and two steps forward and one step back. Because there's something happening in your brain, it's called synaptic pruning, where you're actually refining neural pathways as you go forward with the information. So this means that appreciating, appreciating the general cycle of learning. It's not just that a kid, oh, but he knew how to do this yesterday, what's wrong with him today? The truth of the matter, that's totally normal. A consolidation of the information as you go along, reconfirm it, use it in a new context, solidify it, prune it. Now I have this refined neural pathway, it makes it quicker to be able to react, right? So we know that there are constant changes in the brain. How many of you have ever taught a little kid how to read, or an adult? Have you ever taught anybody to read? A room full of 2,000 educators and nobody has taught anybody to read. That's what's going on in Hawaii? Oh no, okay. Okay, we got a couple of you there. You weren't a parent? Yeah, okay, parent. okay, so. Have you ever noticed that you teach somebody to read, right? You teach them symbol to sound, you sound out words, you animate stories, you put your fingers on the words, you do all this days and weeks and months. And one moment, he reads. Did he learn to read in that second? No. There are at least 16 different neural pathways that need to be primed before that kid can actually read. And when they are all ready, then he can read. So one of the bigger ideas that we have here is that appreciating this learning cycle and also understanding there are constant changes in your brain, but most of them are invisible as far as behavior is concerned. So some of us get totally frustrated, right? It's like, oh, I tried this, I tried that, I tried the other thing. This kid's really dense, he doesn't get anything, right? And you think, oh, what is wrong with him? The truth of the matter is you are making headway. You are slowly but surely creating what's necessary to have the, all of those neural circuits ready so that somebody is able to then execute a behavior or an activity or understand how to add or read or whatever it is. But it's very complicated. It's not just like I do one thing, it results in something else. I have to reinforce, reinforce multiple pathways before that kid will learn to read. So this is understanding and appreciation that there are constant changes and to understand that cycles are not A to B. They're very much sometimes going backwards and that's totally normal, right? The, the, I guess the big and final point is that he knew he could change the mood. He knew that he could have kids that came in sad or angry or ready to beat each other up and then he could have them in the same room and he could make them work together. He knew I'm going to ask you guys a quick question. Do you think that you smile because you're happy, or are you happy because you smile? Yes. <laughs> Both things. So interesting. We know that even like blind babies will smile, so it's an in innate thing. When you feel pleasure, you'll smile. But your brain is now so connected to the idea when this combination of muscles is happening, that means I'm happy. 
So basically, you can make yourself a little bit happier by smiling. But the other thing we know is that when I smile at you, the likelihood is you're going to smile back. And when I see you smiling at me, that makes me even happier, right? So he knew this without anybody telling him the neuroscience. He knew that his mood was contagious. And this gets to the point, in, in, uh, in, in as far as the brain is concerned, it's called contagion or cognition. First, you have to know what's going on in your brain, what's going on as far as the atmosphere, and then you have to be able to manage it. Am I aware of these social interactions and what it is that is happening here? And then can I actually manage that? Can I change that? And that's really at the heart of all of emotional intelligence or social emotional learning is actually understanding what is the social dynamic that we have, how is it that we interact with each other, and the dynamics of the classroom. So standing back from that, basically it's sort of like maybe an over analysis of what I think uh, was great teaching. My dad was a great teacher, you can leave it at that. But I believe that teaching is teachable. And so having people understand what leads to, what is actually happening in your brain is a very powerful tool for teachers to have, okay? So why should we overanalyze this? I wanna ask you, how do you start questions? What are the words you can use to start a question? How, why, who, what, when? So if all of these are the types of words we use to start questions, I think Sugata said this yesterday, there's some level of questions that if Google or Siri or Alexa can answer it, it's kind of low level information. It can be found somewhere, right? The joy of learning really comes in being able to tackle these more complex questions, things that are more critical and creative. And so actually getting to the theory of why, if we can ask why and how things work, how is my brain really doing that? I was uh, just at the Punahou schools and Kamehameha schools and loving when you have interactions with kids, they ask the best questions, the best questions. And usually it is. I want to know just how sometimes the memory gets in there and sometimes it doesn't. Brilliant. How does my brain make a memory? Brilliant question. Because they figure, if one, now I know how to do that, what would I do better the next time? How will I approach that learning a different way? So in, when we talk about the past, maybe 50 years ago, we really were acknowledging, this is great teaching, what we do and um, what we call it. Okay, that's important. And that's telling, me, uh, telling us basically what works, right? So if I say that my dad believed in his students and we now call that uh, you know, understanding and, and fostering growth mindsets, that's very good. And a lot of you are gonna be happy to stop there. But I'm gonna extend this invitation to some of you who are willing to sort of go beyond, just tell me what to do next in the classroom, tell me an activity. And those of you who wanna to go to the why questions, if you know how your brain works, then you understand why it works. And once you know why it works, it empowers you to now make better choices about the activities and the interactions you have in classrooms, okay? So this is kind of the push to get you to why ask why. And this is very philosophical debate, like we have all these articles from like the 80s, you know, talking about the heuristics of attributional research. My own personal theory is much more aligned to um, Elmo. You ask why because that is what the brain does. It's insatiable, it, it wants, it's always a three-year-old mentality. But why, but why, but why? That's brilliant. And if we can sort of recapture that in our own formation as teachers, that's really the essence of why we all became teachers, I think, at least for me. I became a teacher because it's the closest thing to being an eternal student. It's so cool to learn new stuff, right? So hopefully we can recapture that and I can uh, convince some of you guys to tip in this direction. So in summary, then I'd say basically, the essence of great teaching has not changed that much. I think that my dad would still be a great teacher right now if he was still teaching because the things that he did, that artistry, I think are still valued. What has changed is our better understanding of what influences student learning outcomes. So we now have more longitudinal studies, for example. Education is only about 150 years old, but now we can actually compare whole cohorts of kids who grew up 
and who, some who did something and some who didn't do another. For example, those who did brain gym and those who didn't. And we follow them for 14 years and we realize there's absolutely zero difference in their abilities after they've gone through that program. So this informs decisions about what we choose to do and how we spend our time in our classrooms. We also now have internationally comparative scales. This means that we can look at and understand what is true about all human brains and then what things are changed due to cultural influences, especially things like artifacts like writing. For example, how many of you know what that says? Niju Ichi, right? That's 21. Okay, in Japanese, very interesting. If you write in Japanese, you have two, ten, one. Totally logical, right? Very interesting. It's kind of like the way we used to write Roman numerals, right? You have two, you know, you have the two tens and then you have the one. But these days, when we use the Arabic numerals, sometimes this doesn't make the same logical sense, and actually it's a distinct neural pathway in your brain that is you know, hanging on to that piece of information, which is very interesting because stylistically it's changed. But did you know that original Arabic numbers actually were totally logical? Uh, you just had to count the number of angles. Do you see two angles? Two and has two angles, and one has one angle. So think about three, same thing. Four. So the numbers used to be more logical than they are now, but this changes the way that you have neural pathways in your brain for sort of storing things like numbers and letters, okay? And we also have information that is um, methodologically comparative. We can now compare scales. Before you used to think, oh, that's qualitative research, that's quantitative, or that has to do with developmental trajectories of a kid, or that's a classroom intervention. But now, thanks to this uh, wonderful work of John Hetty, you're able to actually compare very different things and look at their effect sizes. What is really worth doing in classroom settings? So the idea would be to uh, understand the things that do harm, <laughs> try to stay away from the things that are just developmental. If you just sit there, you're gonna learn something because you're gonna mature and your brain cannot not learn. Your brain is gonna take in something even if you do nothing else. Or having just you know an average teacher or really having exceptional teachers. We can now look at this and dis make decisions about the types of things we incorporate into our classroom activities. So this means that I'd like to propose to you now a change in education that incorporates mind, brain, and education science. And I say that we need to do this now is because we've been trying for about 150 years to figure this out, and we haven't quite mastered it. Does, is there anybody here who is really sure that they maximize the potential of every single kid in their classroom every year? We haven't really mastered this craft yet, right? And so my suggestion is that we actually have to embrace a slightly more uh, complex way and a more comprehensive way of understanding the brain and how it learns, and that is offered by Mind, Brain, and Education Science. The brain is the most complex organism in the universe, and it's your organ of work. We have to know a little bit more about it. Answers to education cannot be simplistic, which is why I wrote a book, it's, a, it's on neuromyths, it's really a fun book. It actually talks about, you know, well, why, why do we think people use 10% of their brain? Or why would you think that there are different types of abilities in the right and left hemisphere? And why would you think that boys and girls are different? Well, it has a good history. We understand why we used to think like that. But now we have some new information. Now how should we think about that? So this tells us that we have to learn a little bit more about the brain as teachers and teacher education. So that's sort of my pitch to you is that we've evolved a bit in our understanding and it will make us better practitioners. So silently read this, soak it up, take a bunch of pictures, make it your screensaver. <laughs> Leslie Hart recommended in the early 80s that if you are going to pretend to design an educational experience, help another learn, it is almost like saying, go ahead, can you please sew me a glove? And if you don't understand how hands are made or structured, it'd be impossible to make that glove. He suggested back then that teachers who pretend to design educational experiences without a better understanding of the brain are going to be handicapped. 
You might sort of by descriptive idea get some kind of an idea, make some kind of a glove. Or you might create some kind of a lesson that hits some kids sometimes. But you're not going to be able to maximize the potential of all those kids in your room without a better understanding of the brain. OK. So bottom line, unfortunately, after looking at worldwide studies from 2009 all the way until the present around the world, um, unfortunately, most teachers do not know a whole lot about the brain. In fact, most teachers have never had an official course, for example, about the brain and learning. And that's very unfortunate because most of them would actually say, they say they want to have a course on this. So back in 2017, the OECD countries, I was lucky enough to be on this panel, there was making recommendations to all these governments, including the United States, that said, teacher education has to include more information about how the brain works. And that's sort of the change that's happening right now. So if we look at this from this other perspective, they, people usually buy into this. Most teachers, if you ask them, and this is a recent survey that was done of about, I think it was 10,000 teachers. It was done online, and they asked, do you want to know more about the brain? And most teachers say, oh, yeah, I do. I do. But they don't know what to believe, and they don't know what should be taught. So we decide, OK, yes, teachers should know more about the brain, but what should they actually learn? What is the information that would be good to start to share with them? Um, and by the way, just parenthetically, if you see things that are brain-based learning and all the rest of it, and it sounds a little bit too easy, there's a really high probability it is not founded in evidence, nor will it work. Unfortunately. So I'll talk a little bit more about the study that we did. But if we, um, we can created what was called a Delphi panel, which is a panel of experts, right, in a field. So we asked a lot of educational neuroscientists. We asked people in cognitive psychology, um, educational experts. We asked them to review information. And the reason we used a Delphi panel is because it's not just my idea. It's not just your idea. It's not one author's vision. It was basically saying, here's a bunch of really smart people who know a lot about this topic. Let's see if they have consensus about what we should tell teachers, OK? And that's why we use a Delphi panel, because it seeks consensus. And we compared information from a Delphi that was done 10 years ago to one that was done now to see what they believed. What we wanted to ask them is, is there anything that is really true about all brains and human learning that we should tell teachers? And then are there things that are also true, tenants, but that might have a huge range of human variation? For example, do you guys think that motivation is important for learning? Yeah. But what motivates you does not motivate him. So saying, oh, let's do a motivational activity, it's like, for who? For who? Because different people are motivated by different things. So we know this is very important in learning. Motivation is very important. But what motivates one person might not motivate another. There's a huge range of human variants, right? So there's some things that are true for everybody all the time in all contexts. And there's some things that are true but have a huge range of human variants. So those are principles and tenets. In addition to that, then, we also asked them a bunch of other questions, but we're not going to have time to go into that right now. But if you want, on the website, there's a video summary of all of the findings that are there and also the 600-page report if you want some light reading over the weekend. OK. So what are the things that came out of that? We sent 109 invitations to all continents and 41 people responded and participated from 11 different countries. And they were some really tough cookies. Like some of, think of the greatest names you've ever thought of. The experts on uh, childhood development, the experts, Jack Shonkoff at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child, uh, Mary Helene Mordino Yang, people who are great on emotions. Um, we got all of these really tough cookies to get together to see if there was anything they agreed on. And we looked at all the things that the teachers were exposed to in teacher literature and professional development things. Basically, that children had to drink a lot of water, right? Or their brains will shrink. Or that uh, mental capacity is hereditary and it can't be changed by experience. Or that children have attention spans equal to their age plus one. Interesting. Or that listening to classical music would increase uh, their reasoning ability, or that people use 10% of your brains, or that brain development hasn't finished by the time somebody's in puberty, or when we sleep, the brain shuts down, or that some people are right-brained or left-brained. 
We asked them this, we asked them more than 100 different things. And they couldn't just say, I agree or disagree, they actually had to provide evidence. So they say, well, here's my evidence, we do not use 10% of our brain, that's just due to br poor brain imaging back in the 90s. Um, here's my evidence, looking at neural networks, you're using so much more than 10% of the brain. Here's my paper, my research. And we created these nice folders of all of this evidence. And then we sent it back to the whole group. Well, 98% of you believe that neuroplasticity exists and here's the evidence. Do you agree on how it's worded and how we should share it with teachers? And so we went back and forth to get consensus, right? Unfortunately, what we found out of those 100 different things is that there were more, <laughs> <laughs> more myths being floated in teacher education than there were truths. And there was a lot of stuff because, unfortunately, a lot of people believe in myths because it makes it easy. Um, we like to be told, you know, just paint your room a light green. You know, we have evidence in um, prisons, when they're painted light green, there's less fighting, therefore paint your classroom that way. It's like, no. If it sounds too easy or too good to be true, it usually is not true. Okay, so coming through with that, we have uh, now some published reports in case you're interested in, in having a look at that that sort of summarizes this, but understanding the myths is a really big part of teacher education, getting away from those myths and then hanging on to those few good things. So over the past 10 years, teacher education has evolved a bit. What's fascinating is that the science has only been confirmed. 10 years ago, we thought that there were only five things we should tell teachers. Now there's six which is very interesting. But 10 years ago, we only had like 29 myths, but now we have more than 70 myths. This means like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? People know a teeny bit and they start to run with stuff and they make stuff up, right? So this leads to a kind of a pathway. How should teachers be formed in the future? Number one, we gotta get rid of the myths. We have to get rid of this right and left brain discussion and then we can teach the few good things that are true, these handful of things that are true about the human brain. Then we can get into the subtleties. This is also true, motivation, for example, sleep. All these things are important for learning, but guess what? There's a huge range of human variants, so I can't dictate exactly how to do it, right? Then we must take into consideration the cultural contexts in which this is occurring because of those things like the cultural artifacts I was mentioning to you that do slightly change things a little bit, right? And after we've done all that, then we can talk about, okay, this is a great activity for your class or something like that. But we shouldn't jump to say, what should I do? I want to do brain-based stuff. Tell me what to do. Again, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. We're going to talk about some of those myths in just a second. But this means actually embracing things that come from all of the learning sciences. This means understanding a little bit more about how nutrition influences learning or how sleep can change uh, potential to learn. And also under understanding things about what's going on in people's brains are working a little bit differently. Every single person's. Now what's going on in this kid's brain, right? Understanding a bit more about neuroscience and psychology. And actually reaching this midpoint, everybody is studying how the brain learns. Mind, brain, and education science tries to study how we should teach to take advantage of what we know about how the brain learns. Okay, so it's a slightly different vision of how we should undertake teacher education. The beauty of mind brain education science from my perspective is that different researchers are doing things at different levels. So there's some people who are really looking at this molecular level. How are cells changed? How are neural networks built, right? But other people in mind brain education science are looking at a kid, why is this kid, why is this kid who's got a twin so different from his twin? We look at individuals and how that works. But mind, brain, and education science is very complex and it takes on actually things like the classroom, which are lots of groups of people, individuals with billions of neurons and all kinds of firings and tries to understand the dynamic of that space. For example, the Brain and Behavior Institute in uh, Queensland in Australia is now doing this amazing study looking at a real lab situation. So they create a lab school where they observe these kids and they come for six to seven weeks to do things like um, study science, seventh grade science with their real teacher. 
but they're wired up. They have something on like a Fitbit that measures their blood pressure, heart rate, they're microphoned up so that they can hear all the conversations. And every once in a while, they'll lick a little piece of paper and so you can get a measure of cortisol to see what level of stress they might be experiencing based on what's happening. And this huge analysis is helping us understand the messiness of a classroom and how one kid can tip all these others into doing something wrong or whatever. How does this dynamic work? And that's all part of mind, brain, and education science as well. But then there's this additional field that looks at global comparisons, and it's called cultural neuroscience. We're looking at seeing how different groups of people, whole societies, might differ from others in the way their brains are actually taking on information. So mind, brain, and education science is beautiful and broad. It's got a lot of different angles to it, but this would be part of the start here. And this means basically asking us to have a new model. It means taking mind, brain, and education, understanding information, for example, that comes from visible learning, good, concrete educational research, and then coming up with a different way to think about teacher formation. A teacher is a teacher is a teacher. Unlike every other profession on the earth that sort of has a hierarchy, uh, you can be somebody who's a newbie, like you just got out of teacher college and you're called a teacher. And you can be somebody like Robert who's been teaching for 45 years and you're still a teacher. What do they do in England now, which is very interesting? They have a five-tiered approach. They say, look it, you're newly qualified, that's interesting, but then we want you to become more proficient and then you're advanced, and then you might become, hopefully, someday you'll be an expert, and a handful of you are gonna become master teachers. And that's really cool, because then they take, they recycle the master teachers. When they're about to retire, they keep them on for two more years to accompany the new teachers. Because we lose a huge amount of excellent teachers in the first one, two years of teaching, because it's like, oh no, they didn't teach me that. <laughs> they get to the real classroom and the reality is so hard. But instead, this idea is that you accompany them throughout their profession. So you go deeper into your profession, right? You learn more about the brain, you learn more about techniques and uh, different activities, but you don't learn more stuff, you also go deeper. You become more deeply understanding of your field. And this means moving from education to actually now becoming learning scientists. I just want you to take one second to think to yourself, am I willing to go there? Many teachers say, look, I'm happy, I'm a teacher, just, you know, I don't want to get into that whole brain stuff. And that's okay, that's okay. But I just like to put out the plea. At this stage of the game, we really need at least a handful of brave people who are saying, I am willing to become a learning scientist because I understand that education alone has not been able to answer all of the questions I have about how to tackle all of the kids in my class and help them learn to their best potential. It's moving on, it's a different vision of how we think of education. And this means in teacher education programs, there's a new kind of a curriculum. Teachers will learn a bit more about things related to neuroscience and psychology, not just how to do a lesson plan, but actually how do people become motivated, and a, what is consciousness? How do memories get solidified in your brain? You say, oh, I did this perfect activity, how come they just didn't remember it? How does that happen in the brain? When and how are attention spans you know, called upon? All of those different things have to now become part of new teacher education, and there are groups doing this. If you haven't heard of the Deans for Impact, it's an, a powerful group. It's teacher colleges that, a consortium of teacher colleges that have decided to embrace more information about the brain for their teachers. They realize this is a necessity. So going back to this, looking at neuromyths, looking at principles and tenets, I just want to mention a handful of each of these things so that we can be a little bit clear. Uh, using the OECD criteria of things that have good evidence, some things that are probably so, but mixed evidence, some things that are intelligent speculation and things that are just myths, we come to the conclusion that everything you see on the screen right here is a myth. And these things are myths because back in the day, maybe in the 80s, early 90s, when we only had these little cartoon drawings of things, it was a good approximation of what we thought we knew. And it's also, it sells books. <laughs> uh, there's a, a fellow I've uh, presented in similar conferences, very interesting. His books 
sell like hotcakes because he suggests you do things like sit in circles and pass around a candle because boys need contact with flame uh, or fire yeah, before they are focused. Okay, cool. But guess what? I bet every kid in that room is really like cool, you know? So I don't think it's the flame thing. But anyways, people <laughs> promote all kinds of very interesting things, okay? Everything here is a myth, and if you want the research on every single one of these, we have volumes discrediting things that are up there, because we begin to know slightly more about the brain. We know that the brain is um, also cannot, you don't have a learning style, guys. Um, everybody is visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. But if you tell a kid when he's 10 years old, oh yeah, and you are totally an auditory learner, mm. And I'm visual, that's why you didn't learn very well. <laughs> it does harm to that kid. But if you tell him he's an auditory learner, actually he will spend the rest of his life looking for auditory cues. And he will actually become better at that because he's sort of narrowed in on that modality. But if you give your brain the chance, it really wants to learn through all of the modalities. It's always trying to get all the information it possibly can. So there's no such thing as learning styles. Um, you cannot multitask. Ta-da! All of you who think that you are now correcting homework and listening to me, you are not. <laughs> Your brain can only do one heavy cognitive load thing at a time, OK? If something is habituated, like chopping the vegetables and talking to your sister on the telephone, you can look like you're doing multiple things because it's low energy on your brain. You're not, it's a habituated task, right? But if even one single high cognitive task occurs, like your kid runs in with a bloody finger, or your sister starts to tell you something really traumatic on the telephone, you have to stop everything because your brain pays attention to one heavy cognitive load task at a time, okay? Multiple myths that occur, okay? So multitasking does not exist. And the reason we wanna get rid of them is basically neuro myths simply do harm. When you tell a girl she doesn't have the right kind of a head for science or logical or mathematical things, you do harm, okay? When you tell a kid, you know, you only use 10% of the brain and, oop, oh, you're full. <laughs> Oh well. <laughs> that does harm, okay? So we want to get away from this because of the reason they do harm. And now we have this more complex understanding. You can measure the brain, how it works electrically or chemically or by oxygenation or different types of increases in white matter track. All of these different things are ways that we can measure the brain. And this kind of beautiful complexity, even if you're not attracted to brain scans, makes you appreciate just one thing. I want you to, uh, to hopefully write this down. Your brain does not work by saying, oh, let's stimulate the reading part of your brain, or something like that. Or math or logic is in this part of the brain or whatever. It's actually composed of incredibly complex networks. There is nothing your brain does that's only one hemisphere or another. It is always an integrated system, always, okay? So now I don't know if any of you have seen these newer scans from the Connectome Project, but the Connectome Project actually combines all of these different types of neuroimaging. It shows you the electrical, the chemical, the white track, it puts them all together so that we can have a more complex appreciation of just how the brain really works. And based on all of this information, we can now say, okay, yeah, maybe there is a node. A node means a place in the brain where the signal passes through multiple times during a specific activity. Maybe there are specific nodes, but that's not where language is. That's not where reasoning is. That's not, it's not in a single part of the brain. That's called localizationalism and it kind of went out of style in about 1895, okay? We don't talk about this piece of your brain does X, okay? It's a much more complex system of different types of networks. And one of the brilliant things that we've been working on, for example, with the Punahou teachers in literacy, is if teachers can understand there's at least these 16 networks that have to be primed. When the teachers understand that, they become better at analyzing and diagnosing what the problem the kid has, okay? 
So they realize, is this really a working memory problem or is it semantic recall? He doesn't remember the meaning of the word. Or is this a problem that he doesn't, he's not able to combine all of the symbols correctly? So he's not a fluid reader, but what does that mean, right? So breaking those down into their smaller parts, inter we can make more accurate interventions in our classrooms, okay? So based on this information, I wanna ask you guys some quick true or false. And they're not really true or false because there's no such thing as truths in science. <laughs> there's just more evidence or less evidence. So it's really, um, is this uh, really strongly evidence-based or is this probably so, or is this intelligent speculation? For example, it's intelligent speculation to think that men and women's brains are different because from the outside they look a little bit different. But there's just not enough evidence to say that there's any difference. There's only about five physiological differences in the brain. And there's no studies that show that that actually manifests itself into different behavior. There's a lot of studies on hormones, definitely. That changes behavior. And men and women share the same hormones, but in different proportions. But it's not because their brains can't do something. So maybe there's only one study on children showing that there's a slight advantage to boys learning spatial activities, but if you give girls four repetitions of new training, they do it better than the boys. So it doesn't really matter. There's no dominance of skill sets based on gender. It's an intelligent speculation, but it's just not true, okay? So I'm gonna give you a couple of questions and I'd like you to tell me where it falls. Is this true or false? So test your own knowledge about the brain, okay? Human brains, are as unique as human faces. First of all, what does that mean? Ask the person at the table next to you if you think you agree on an answer to that. Human brains are as unique as human faces. The bottom line idea is this, right? You have two eyes and two eyes and two eyes and you have one nose and one nose and one nose and you have two ears and two ears. Everybody's got the same parts, right? Same thing about the brains. You all, we all have the same parts of our brains. Does anybody have the same face in here? No way. And this is the same thing about your brain. What changes the brain? What makes the brain unique? What makes the brain unique? Let's just even put it farther. If you have two identical twins, their faces look the same. Are their brains the same? No. Why are their brains different? Experience. Development. Experience. Experience changes the brain, okay? So the uniqueness of the brain, this is the wording, by the way. I didn't have this concluded word. The, the experts agreed. It was very hard to parse words to come to something that 41 people would agree on, but this is the statement that these 41 neuroscientists agreed on. This is true. Tell the teachers this. And if you tell the teachers this, it has implications, doesn't it? What does this tell you about teaching? If you know that brains are unique, what does this tell you about sort of like testing requirements or think about standards instead of mastery or uh, using other things like universal design for learning as opposed to other curriculum structures? It tells you a lot and makes you think, and hopefully some of your policies might change based on that single idea about the brain. How about this one? All brains are equally prepared for all tasks. No, this goes to the point based on the different potentials, right? Thanks to the good genes you got from your parents, thanks to the wonderful environment you grew up in, some of those genes are potentiated, and thanks to your own decisions about what to do in your life, you have different potentials for different types of things, different activities. Now, if you know that's true, what does that tell you about teaching? What does that teach you, tell you about differentiation or inclusion learning? Or does that tell you anything about you know, how we send homework? Should all kids, do all kids need the same thing? One of the easiest low-hanging fruits that we can do in schools is differentiate homework. How many times does a brain need to see something before it knows it? If you dare to answer this, it means you've listened to a neural myth. The answer should always be, in education, whenever somebody asks you a question about the brain, what should it be? It depends. This is my friends over here from Punahou who know, okay. It depends. 
It depends on prior experience. If this kid has a really strong foundation in addition, I can probably teach him to do subtraction in 10 steps. You know, he sees a new thing, he sees the difference between subtraction and addition, he has past knowledge, he can do it fast. But if this kid is weak in addition, I'm trying to teach him subtraction, it might take him 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 reviews of the same concept, right? Differentiating homework for those kids is probably one of the lowest hanging fruits that we have to be able to attend to different potentials. How about this one? Past information influences how you know something new. Absolutely. Your brain is so smart, it does not want to expend energy where it doesn't need to. So the first thing that your brain will do is that we'll look at and see, try to understand what do I already know about this? Before it tries to learn something new, it first passes through the filter of prior experience. And this is huge. If you write nothing else down, write this down. The more you know, the more you can know. Because things pass through the filter of prior experience, the more experiences you have potentiate different types of connections, which means at some point you could connect things to other things that you might not have connected before. The more you know, the more you can know. And all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience, okay? We need to know our students well enough, though, to take advantage of that. How about this? The brain changes constantly with experience. Do you believe that? Absolutely. And usually this occurs, though it can occur beforehand, normally changes occur at a molecular level before you see it in behavior. Remember the example of the kid reading? A lot of these changes are slowly occurring in the brain before you actually see the kid has done something that shows you an activity, that he has actually learned something. Okay? What about plasticity? You guys all buy into the idea that your brains are plastic? Yes? When does your brain stop learning? When you die, very good, yes. You learn until the day you die, okay? And this is a really big and an important idea to, to take into consideration. Many people think, oh no, it's all downhill after adolescence, right? Oh no, it's too hard to learn when I'm an adult. Guess what? There is some truth to this. The energy it takes to learn something new when you're older is slightly more because you basically have to unlearn an awful lot of things before you have the new learning. So it's almost twice as much energy because you're having to decouple things. So it's always better to learn it the best the, the first time around. If a kid has learned through habituated behavior that it's okay that his dad hits his mom and he begins to hit his girlfriend, in order to break that, you actually have to unlearn a behavior to learn a new thing, which takes more energy than just doing it right the first time, right? Okay? There's no learning without some form of memory and attention. That's the very first thing I was hoping you guys would remember today. <laughs> okay, so memory and attention are vital to learning. Okay, so we talked about these well-established things. We mentioned some of these neuromyths, and just so that you know, this idea of the tenants. The tenants are things that are true for all human brains, except for there's a big range in human variation. We all have bodies, but they all are a little bit different, right? We all sleep but we all have slightly different patterns, right? Those things are totally normal. We found 21 things with the experts that are true, but there's a huge range of human variants, which is why you can't dictate. You can never tell, oh, you're a nine-year-old, therefore you should sleep, let me do the calculation, X amount of time, doesn't work. It is normal for a human being to sleep between four and a half and 12 hours, that's normal. The average person might sleep eight, but it's normal in this range. Know thyself. People have to understand themselves to be able to measure what's correct. So these are the 21 things, and we don't have time to go into them. But there are some summaries about this information on the website if you'd like to look into these things and the implications they have for teaching and learning, right? The big idea is that if anybody tells you, oh, I have an attention-getting activity, or I have a motivational activity I'm going to teach you, tell them, it's like throwing spaghetti at a wall. Some of it's going to stick with some of those kids, and it's, some of it's not. Different kids need different things at different times. Remember that, OK? OK. So looking at these different tenets and motivations, the only thing I just wanted to share with you is a couple more myths. Read and weep. <laughs> 
There are more than 70. I'm just throwing up a couple of the more common ones just so that you're clear on this. And if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, we do have a Q&A session. I'm very happy to go deep into the research on each of these points. But just sort of want to call this to your attention because these are things that we see in the popular press. These are things that we see all the time, but we have to break that before we can actually get to the good information, okay? Uh, that's, isn't that, I'm sorry, I told my editor, it's like, oh my gosh, what kind of a, what are you doing? And they said, no, no, this is for millennial teachers. They really will like this whole like comic book angle. And I'm like, oh no, this is the cover of my very serious book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> ah, anyways, okay. And we said that myths do harm because we know that one of the greatest influencing factors in student success is what a student thinks of his own ability to achieve. And all myths do harm. They lower that potential. They lower the ability, the, the thought process of a kid, I can do this. Okay? So we have to get rid of myths because of that. Okay. So I can see a lot of you here, a little bit of nerves or whatever. Hopefully most of you, I mean, what are the possible outcomes? Many, hopefully most of you are going to say, terrific. I feel totally vindicated. I'm doing this right. And that's great. We're going to have a lot of happy teachers. That's pretty good. I think that's going to be the majority of this group, right? And then some of you, though, are going to feel a little confused. And maybe some of you are going to feel even attacked. Because if I tell you something like, brain gym doesn't work, and you are a brain gym representative, you're probably feeling really bad right now, right? And then there might be some of you who are actually feeling a little bit panicked because you're about to present something and you have to run out right now and change some slides. <laughs> I presume this is going to happen, but what I really hope happens, and I was always taught, instead of saying the word but, you should always say and, and it doesn't really change the meaning. It's much more positive. Is that true? I don't know. And I hope that everybody leaves. 100% of us are going to leave with this kind of tickle about feeling, oh, this is cool, but I don't really get it. And that's a healthy confusion, right? And that it leads to intellectual curiosity, and that hopefully that intellectual curiosity will lead to better knowledge. But the whole idea is this. It doesn't stop at knowledge. There's a big saying in Latin, right? To know is not enough, right? Knowing stuff is cool, but it actually means nothing in our profession. You can know a lot of things, but unless you operationalize it, unless you use it, unless you take advantage of it, it makes no difference to our profession. So to know is not enough. You have to go beyond knowing and actually buy into doing something. And I would recommend, if you guys have the chance, this is the penultimate slide here. <laughs> There's a very simple thing that all teachers could do, and I don't think we realize this. Did you know that teachers do more experiments in one day than a neuroscientist does in their entire life? <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> this is the most important profession in society. But did we come to move into this field of learning scientists instead of educators, learning scientists, I'm now, now using evidence, we have to become better at documenting things. And I know you do this in your head already, but just get a notebook. What did I plan to do? What did I really do? Did it work? Why or why not? Just that small piece of reflection at the end of the day will make us all better teachers, OK? So remember I promised you I'm going to make you go to work here? I don't know if I did or not, but I will feel successful if you can tell me I learned these three things. At least I learned three things, OK? Um, and there's two things I want to know more about, and there's one thing I might change. Can I give you one minute of silence before I wrap this up? I would like you to do it now because if you stand up and walk out of this room without writing it down, I promise you, it's gone by lunchtime. Please write it down right now. Three, two, one. Three things you didn't know before, two things that you're curious about now, and one thing that you think you're going to change about your professional practice based on the information we shared today. And then I'm going to give you the four, my four big ideas, and we can compare notes, OK? And it's totally not cheating to talk. <laughs> did she really say whatever? Oh, did you, did you get the same thing? I mean, it's, it's OK to talk. That's part of learning. One plus one is three. 
I would like to motivate you to do the same exercise on any of the sessions you go to today. And this is kind of like putting your finger on the pulse. Was this worth going to? I learned something new. I'm curious about something now, and I'm going to do something different. That's a big deal, OK? So in summary, I told you I was going to leave you with four big ideas. This is the last slide here. Mind brain and education is very cool. And in general, it confirms best practice teaching. For the most part, we can actually find direct correlations between what we know goes on in the brain and what teachers do in this beautiful art that they have of teaching, OK? Mind brain and education is also a transdisciplinary vision. It sort of trains you to always look at things not only just from an educator's perspective, but what's going on from a biological perspective or a nutritional perspective or psychological perspective. And it's superior than just looking at one, one vision. There's no problem you will ever face in life that is better attended to by just looking at it like a mathematician, a historian, an art artist. Transdisciplinary thinking is really much more superior, OK? The third idea is that I'd like to challenge you to take on this idea that you are learning scientists. And this moves our work into being not only art, but also evidence-based. And the fourth idea is to not just come to conferences like this to ask, what should I do next, but ask, why does it work? Get to the why, OK? I hope those are things that, are, that have also jumped out at you today. I will uh, leave you with the same kind of an invitation. Please write to me if you have any doubts or questions. I love talking to people who care about this topic. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.